Red Test. Sweet. Sour. So good to test. Welcome to our Iowa Cook segment of Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM and streaming live on live stream. I'm Steve Boss, and we are at Green Building Supply. We want to thank them, of course, for sponsoring this show and also for everybody's because we have lots of wonderful food here from them. And our special guest is Astrid Griffin. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Really very, very intrigued <laughs> because you are going to make quiche. And one of the varieties of quiche that you're going to make is a vegan quiche. And when I think about quiche, of course, I think about cheese, mm -hmm. and I think about eggs, and crust, right? No, flaky crust. Right. <laughs> All the things that I would not attribute to vegan food. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And it was, it was hard trying to figure out how to recreate that nostalgia when making a quiche that didn't have anything that normally we put with quiches. But I feel like we did a good job. I feel like I did a good job with that. <laughs> I was just going to say, who's the we? I don't know. I was giving you credit. <laughs> well, it was because I gave you encouragement. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. But yeah, it turned out really well. Instead of tofu, because normally when you do vegan or vegetarian dishes, people kind of push tofu on everyone. And so I tried to steer away from that for anyone who had soy allergies, anyone who just wanted to do something different. So instead we used uh, garbanzo bean flour and we made kind of a, almost a roux with the garbanzo bean flour to do more of a thick filling for that. And then we used nutritional yeast. We had um, some vegetable stock. We just add spices to it and lots of really well cooked and spiced vegetables to help kind of incorporate that texture and flavor of a of a normal quiche so okay that's going to be really yeah. exciting to actually try and we're going to see you prepare that in the second half hour of our segment here but before that let's learn a little bit about you because you have a tremendous passion for cooking and for food and the little statement that you sent me about yourself We'll, we're going to talk about that too, yeah. but I want to know a little bit about your background because I know that you're a graduate of Indian Hills mm -hmm. Culinary Arts Program. So before that, how did you get interested in food and how did you end up there? Um, you know, I actually kind of wonder that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Growing up, my mom wasn't always the best cook. I'm sorry. She's in the audience right now. I'm sorry. But um, <laughs> so my sister and I always kind of cooked for ourselves and baked for each other and played around with a lot of different things. I never really thought about how much I loved food and I loved cooking until one of those career days in high school when people come into the school and they kind of demo things and try to get you interested in everything to figure out what you want to do, where your passion is. And I saw one of the instructors from Indian Hills doing food art and garmage. And I just was so amazed by what she was doing, the bird she was making out of apples and the radish display she was doing for plates. And it just, it reeled me in. And so for prom that year, I took money, I gave everyone a menu that I made, and I had them pick out what they wanted to do, and I spent the entirety before prom, instead of getting my hair done and my nails done, I cooked everybody's dinner. So they showed up at the, they showed up at the house in which we were doing our prom dinner at, all just dressed to the nines. I had my gown on and a big apron over it. I had a big hat covering my hair that I had done in five minutes, and I plated all the food up. I set everybody down, and we were, I think, an hour late to prom just because we enjoyed the food so much and sat around the table, which, in retrospect, is, is exactly where I'd want to be. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Do you remember the menu? Um, Slightly. One of them was a braised chicken in a red wine. And then we did um, a... Um, Isn't it we again? Oh, I know, I know. Well, I, I cook for people. So whenever I cook, I always incorporate the people that I'm cooking for into it. So instead of I, it's more of a we because I share the energy with people that I cook for. Um, so I never really take credit for everything that I do. Sorry, I'll start, start changing it to I. Um, but I did a braised chicken breast, and then I had um, a homemade ravioli with fresh ricotta cheese in the middle. 
And that's all I remember. And then I remember I asked people if they wanted tea, if they wanted coffee or Italian soda. And that was, <laughs> that was the only other thing I remember from that menu. Uh, it must have been a, a, a memorable evening for everyone who ate there because I'm certain that all the, men, all the restaurant choices that they had otherwise couldn't even compare to uh, eating at your house and what, what you created for them. All right, so you went to Indian Hills. Mm -hmm. And after you graduated from Indian Hills, you did some traveling, right? Uh, yes, I actually I did some traveling while I was in Indian Hills and then some at the very end and then finally finished with a internship in which I spent a number of months in San Francisco working at Greens. Uh, the first expedition I made was to Italy and it was with a culinary group so we traveled around we met a bunch of different chefs we cooked we learned we went to fresh farmers markets that was the first place that I really learned about getting fresh produce where everything came from about the quality of the food that you're using as opposed to just going to a grocery store having it locally sourced having it um, created and grown with love instead of just manufactured in a mass production facility um, then after we came back from there, I finished up school. I went to France. And again, the same thing in France. I spent a couple weeks over there just traveling around, cooking with people, taking classes, doing uh, demos, taking part, just really immersing myself in everything that they had to teach me there. And then once I got back from that, I went on a I think a five month internship at Greens in San Francisco. And if you've never heard of Greens, I don't know, have you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we should tell everyone about Greens. Yeah. Uh, Greens is a really, really wonderful farm-to-table restaurant that's on the pier in Fort Mason. They, everything that's in the restaurant, it was, it was amazing because they don't throw anything away. If they have any garbage, it's put into two cans. It's either put into a recycling bin or it's put into a compost bin and everything else there's there's no other trash they don't have a dumpster they don't have anything like that so all the compost gets sent out to a farm in which it's composted the veggies are grown everything is sourced locally all the cheese they get local all of the citrus they get local everything is made in-house i remember the first day i started interning there i had to make a pint of lemon juice by squeezing all of the lemons myself and i was so nervous that i knocked it over and spilled it all over the place and typical intern yeah oh yeah completely i had to get that out of the way right off the bat but yeah it was it was amazing and just spending the time out there and being around annie somerville being around all the amazing chefs that i worked with was just Seeing myself at the beginning and then seeing myself how I felt and how I functioned at the end was just amazing. Every day I would call my chef, Chef Gordon, and tell him about what I had experienced and what I learned that day and how excited I was to go back and how nervous I was to go back because I didn't know, I didn't, I felt like I didn't know anything. But at the same time, I felt like every day I was learning and taking so much in that how could I not want to go back even though I, I felt yeah, I felt like I didn't know anything, but it was just the prospect of learning that was incredible to me. But it's it's the food yeah. world. I mean, the more you know, the less you, the more you realize you don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's, it's infinite. It's totally an infinite world. But, but speaking of greens, just so uh, I, you may not know this, but Deborah Madison, who is the founding chef and also one of the owners of greens, mm -hmm. well, along with Edward Espy Brown, I think that was... Uh, the other guy, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she's actually been on the show several times, and she'll be on the show again in Febru February, I think, yes. So, yeah, she's the James Beard award-winning award -winning author of the vegetarian, what, Vegetarian Cooking for Everyone, right? Whose new edition last year actually was one of the top cookbooks of the year. So, yeah, we're, we're pretty excited about yeah. having her on. She's been doing some seasonal cooking shows with us, so she'll be on doing winter. Uh, at the end of February. Oh, yes. I have heard that program with you before. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Didn't quite click for me. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone listens, I think. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. In passing. Yeah. When we can. Definitely. <laughs> All right. So you, you had some experience cooking in, in France and Italy. And obviously, these are the things that anyone who goes to culinary school or doesn't go to culinary school and is interested in cooking needs to do. You've got to experience these other cultures and, and hopefully experience them with in the culture itself, yeah. that's that's really key to get a well-rounded culinary education, right? And then you worked for six, what, how long again at Greens? Five or six months. Five or six months. And then you didn't really, you didn't really stick with 
the culinary field in that sense. <laughs> Uh, I managed a restaurant for a number of years after I graduated from culinary school. I was planning on heading back out to San Francisco, but then I decided to get some other life experience out of my belt. I got married, I got divorced, I kind of stayed put for a little while, um, and I'm just kind of breaking back out of that shell. Um, I worked managing a restaurant for a number of years, and then at the conclusion of that work experience, I decided to take a break from the culinary profession, just because when you're around it so much, you, ha you almost have to take a break just to reappreciate it and go back to it with a sense of love as opposed to working the day-to-day -day grind and taking it for granted. So that's kind of what I've done right now is I've given myself a break. I still cook every day. I still experiment every day that I can. Um, and I'm still growing in every way that I possibly can. I've tried to start up a couple different restaurants, which haven't worked out just because of funding and situations and everything. but. Um, Looking back on it, I'm glad it didn't because I could have stuck myself in a rut there and I'm in a much better place now to continue to explore and expand myself and provide things that I wouldn't have provided at that point to people who would come to enjoy my atmosphere whenever it does happen. So It's not a profession for anyone who has a little faintness of heart. You have to be completely dedicated or else it, it can't possibly work. Yeah, yeah, and that's something that uh, my boyfriend and I have talked about a lot because we both have a lot of culinary experience. And whenever I talk about my restaurant, he always just steps back and says, are you sure that that's what you want to devote your life to and all of your time to? And there's nothing I can say besides yes. So Nice. Do you want to tell us about it? Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, it's, it's grown and morphed over the years, but I want to do a farm-to-table restaurant. I want it to be something that uses local food providers um, as much as possible from my own farm. Um, I'm looking to buy land. I'm looking to set up my own restaurant, have uh, kind of people that will work the land and then bring that to the table so that we can have in the most truest of sense, a true farm-to-table restaurant. Instead of trying to source what I can locally and get other things, you know, maybe from a food provider, or maybe from like a mass-produced place, I'm trying to get everything from the smallest, most local sources possible. Um, along with that, I, I very much so believe that anyone who walks into my door should be welcomed and should be catered to and should feel like they're home and not feel weird asking for anything that they have a dietary restriction, they don't like meat, they love meat, but they don't like gluten or anything that they should have a request f in order for me to serve them properly. I want them to feel comfortable coming in and feeling like everything that they need to nourish themselves is provided for them. So I experiment a lot with gluten-free baking. I experiment a lot with um, paleo diets. I explore a lot with meat diets, but that don't have, um, like one thing my brother is experiencing right now is he was just told by a doctor that he has too much cholesterol. So he's kind of having to morph his diet to get rid of some of the fat in his diet that he would normally have, like butter or um, they told him coconut oil, but I told him to keep that. So, <laughs> but just things w in which he normally would be a staple in his diet and he's trying to morph around with stuff so a lot of times I'll go home and I'll do a little cooking demo or I'll set my phone down and I'll do a demo for him showing him how to recreate his favorite things that he eats all the time for lunch and brings to snack with him when he's on set um, just kind of help him recreate what he loves in a means that is sustainable for him and his body which is something that's really important and that's what I really want to focus on there is having options for everyone who needs an option. So you envision that the restaurant itself will be on the grounds of the farm? I think that would be idyllic, yeah, with a patio overlooking the farm. Maybe some candlelights in the evening. <laughs> no, it's great. I, yeah, I, Blue Hill at Stone Barns is, is a perfect example of a, of a working farm that has the restaurant right on the farm itself yeah. and they don't have a patio but they have a nice little, it's like cobblestone, um, you know, I don't know, area yeah. outside. And you can actually stare into the uh, kitchen from the windows, which is really kind yeah. of fun as a, you know, you can be a voyeur that way. Yeah, well, it, it incorporates everybody then. It's not like somebody's cooking your food in a back area that they don't have any sunlight, they can't see you, you can't see them. I like it to all be integrated enough to where 
you you can visually interact with each other as well as then they can see you prepare the food they can see the love and energy that goes into it and then you can see them enjoy it when it comes out to them that's why i love open kitchens yeah, I, I, yeah me too it's it's definitely some people don't like it just because they don't like to feel like they're looked at and especially people i've encountered a lot of people who working in a kitchen like to be behind that door and don't like to come out and get praise at all so it's it's interesting to see who likes it and who doesn't, but I'm definitely totally for it. And one of the things about greens that I loved so much was just an entire wall of the restaurant was windows. And so you never felt like you were working in a dark space. You always had light coming through. You always had fresh energy coming in. It was, it was never you cooking in a dark, stale environment. It was always having that energy, having that, um, that light and that interaction with everyone else that was around you. So. Astrid Griffin is our guest on Great Taste. You are listening to KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar power voice of Fairfield, Iowa, or you might be watching this on live stream or on Fairfield Media Center's cable channel. Is that right, Jason? Cable? Is that the right word? I don't know. Oh, good. I'm so glad because I don't know, you know if it's cable or what. It works. Okay. And we want to thank Fairfield Media Center for always being here and uh, making this the video happen of these Great Taste episodes. So we're getting to know a little bit about you as a person which i love because it it really it, it's going to going to enhance the flavors of the food you know tremendously and that's another reason why i love open kitchens because if you get to know i, I had a restaurant in chicago where i used to go as often as i possibly could bob blankenship has been there a couple of times i think and unfortunately the chef's gone now jason vincent uh, and i don't think he's picked up anything else yet because he had he and his wife had their second child and i think he wanted to take some time off yeah. because of that uh, but it was an open kitchen and one of the things that i think is really fascinating about open kitchens besides the fact that it gives you the opportunity to really see what's going on and you as a restaurant as an eater at a restaurant can also participate in the creation experience because you can actually watch and see how they're doing things but the other thing that occurred to me as i watched these people in in that kitchen and other kitchens is that i believe that even the chefs have to have a certain temperament to actually work in an open kitchen you alluded to that a little bit because you can't just say anything that you want to say <laughs> and you even your tone has to be tempered somewhat sometimes. Yeah. And I think you have to have more of a, and I'm not saying you have to, but I think that a lot of the people end up being more gregarious who are working in an open kitchen. And you can really see the interplay back and forth. And I'll never forget this one experience that I had at Hearth in New York City uh, when Marco Canora, um, it was his first restaurant there, I believe. And I saw him say something to one of the line chefs and you could tell that he knew that he was in an open kitchen because this this was a kitchen where you had there were four seats mm -hmm. at the counter right next to the, where the expediting was going on so it wasn't the, the kitchen wasn't open to everybody but mm -hmm. if you got there they did, didn't take reservations for those seats but if you got there you were lucky and got to sit yeah. there and watch it and he he just he said to this line cook he said it's not hot and the the power in those words yeah was enough to make me wilt and, and it wasn't it, but 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 you could tell that he was you know he, he had to do that in a way that he could get his point across yeah. but in another way he had to be really careful because he's got four people sitting right yeah. there you know watching every move that he's making yeah. and listening to him you know it was it was it was fascinating and the guy you know he just yeah chef you know yeah well and that's another thing that um that i, I witness a lot that i kind of disagree with on a personal level, but people portray chefs out to be these these angry, intense, super fiery, driven people that just are, you know, just storming around a kitchen and the head chefs are always yelling at everybody else in the kitchen and throwing things around and throwing temper tantrums. And really that's A, not healthy for them, and B, it shouldn't be the case. Uh, food should be made with the utmost care and respect and if you treat people in your work environment with respect and you treat people with good communication it'll only build that and create a better environment and a better situation for everybody that's involved and it, and then it shows into the food too because if you have someone who's stressed out if you have someone who's being yelled at someone who's experiencing a lot of stress they could mess up the food they could do something that um, just puts bad energy into the food so to say and it sounds so 
esoteric. Yeah, yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> but it's so true. I mean, mm -hmm. I, we've discussed this so many times uh, on the show, all kinds of different things like that. And when you're when you're in a kitchen, I, I remember one specific time when I was in a kitchen of uh, a friend's uh, in, in Philadelphia, and I watched as it was so, so quiet. And, and I always thought that was fascinating because uh, we have a friend in Italy who, that she likes to work in the kitchen by herself. And she'll only have one other person sometimes with her because she wants total quiet in her kitchen. She doesn't play rock music or anything like that. Yeah. She wants to just focus on the food itself mm -hmm. and to prepare the best food in a very silent atmosphere. I'm not saying that's the best way to do it. I'm, I'm just explaining yeah. how this chef prefers to work. And what I saw in this other kitchen in Philadelphia was in a very busy time. And one of the line cooks took a towel because he noticed that Another line cook, the guy who was working the pasta station, was sweating, you know, profusely, mm -hmm. top of his forehead. And he just took this towel and he walked over and just wiped the forehead of his fellow, you know, line cook. And I just found that to be so amazingly, it was a moving experience yeah. for, for me, watching that, standing in the kitchen and watching that happen. Just because somebody having so much awareness yeah. and, and feeling like, Oh, you know, I need to take care of my yeah. compatriot here in the kitchen. It was it was awesome. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's really, I mean, to me, that's what food's about. It's about connecting to people. It's about being aware of everyone in your surroundings. It's about being aware of what you're producing, what you're making, where it's going to go, about how everyone that is preparing the food is functioning in that state. So that's kind of the epitome of the beauty behind working in a kitchen and how close you can get and how close knit of a team you are. Because in, in most environments, there's almost a sense of competition, whereas in most, kitchen I've, most kitchens that I've worked in personally, it's not competition, it's teamwork. And it's hard to see that a lot of places besides in a really, really well put together kitchen. Yeah, you, ha you most kitchens, Obviously, the guys who have a lot of money these days can build their kitchens out so that there is a little bit more room to work. But most kitchens, there's a premium of space yeah. in those kitchens. And so you have to learn how to do a ballet. And really, that's the best way to describe it. If you get to watch some the people moving around in the kitchen, it is a ballet. And I, I in particular, you know, I get to sit here. Uh, I've done this for seven years where I talk to chefs or I talk to journalists, right? But I talk about food and I'm really jealous of those people who have skills like you if if I maybe was a little younger maybe I would go to culinary school just to learn not to be in the restaurant business because that's something for people who have a lot more desire than I do to, <laughs> to work way too hard yeah. but to actually get the skills to have a better understanding of what they're doing and and why they're doing it but the the bottom line to that is, is that there if there isn't that teamwork mm -hmm. then I think you're right something will always tend to be a little off mm -hmm. with the experience. Yeah. And the reason that chefs are portrayed in the way that you were talking about mm -hmm. is one of the reasons is because it's true to a degree that yeah. some of them have volatile personalities. Yeah. There's a, most chefs are top, type A types, yeah. for example. <laughs> but the other reason is simply because of television. Mm -hmm. And that makes good TV. Yeah. And so you've got people like Gordon Ramsay, you know, screaming at people. Yeah. And, and, but you can also have the experience where you go to a bathroom, for example, me, in New York at, at a French restaurant, and you are outside the door of the kitchen, and you hear a chef screaming in French, you know, at whomever in the kitchen. I don't speak French, so I didn't know what he was saying. But for me, anyway, and from my experience at the restaurant, that was enough to make me realize I never wanted to go back there again yeah. because it didn't enhance the eating experience. And also, it led me to other conclusions, just like you said. You know, you want something to be, you want a place that's teamwork. You want a place where people are enjoying themselves because all that energy goes into the food. Whether you think that's esoteric or not, it's true. Mm -hmm. Every Everything, life is energy. So it's all going in there. Yeah. So I want to eat somewhere where people are just loving what they're doing. That's mm -hmm. And because that's what they're putting into it. And that's why, now we're gonna segue, into what you wrote. And I'm not sure you remember everything that you wrote to me about, I asked Astrid to give me a little portrait of what, who she is as, as, a, as a chef. And it was just amazingly uh, beautiful. Very simple, but beautiful. And I, I 
really understood that this was part of your whole journey, you know, of, of cooking, that you came to this place, or that you're at this place right now, and this is a place where you feel, as you described, that, you know, essentially it's a place of service, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, when I started cooking when I was younger, it wasn't, it was to feed ourselves and to feed people around us, but it was to connect with family. And my sister and I, I one of my youngest memories of cooking food, besides rice and easy stuff like that was doing these is it mineral rice no no <laughs> i don't think so actually i just remember the rice -a i remember the finished product <laughs> we'll not talk about how we got there <laughs> but um we did they were called cartwheel cookies but they were actually just thumbprint cookies with jam in the middle and i remember i was so excited and elated that i made them that I ran around and I gave them to everybody I could. And it was, uh, my birthday is May 1st, which is May Day. That's my wife's birthday. Oh, really? Ah, well, when I was younger, I used to always put together baskets and run around and drop them off at people's houses. And I had made those cookies, and I was so excited about them. And I saw the uh, pastor walking into the church. So I ran, I got him a whole basket of cookies, and I set them outside of his door, and I hid, I hid behind a bush, waiting for him to come out. And about 45 minutes later, I ran up and I pounded on the door, and I ran behind the bush again. And about another 10 minutes later, I ran up and I pounded on the door, and I ran back behind the bush, and finally he came out and just the look on his face when he received those cookies. He didn't know who put them there. He didn't know what they were, but just I felt that he felt how much love went into that. And seeing... It made an indelible impression. Yeah, yeah. And it's not many things bring so much joy to my heart and so much connection to people that I interact with than cooking them food and then being able to provide for them. And it's something I may not be able to financially provide for everyone. I may not be able to physically provide for everyone, but I'll always be able to serve everyone. And I'll always be able to prepare food for them. And whenever they come over, whenever they're in my environment, they're always welcome to my food. And they're always welcome to sit at my table. So it's a big part of my heart. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. I can absolutely tell that. That's, that's fantastic. I think I better put this over here so I know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> so, I love Chef Raider. So, uh, I, I think that I, I'd just be curious as to, you know, you don't go to school there anymore, and yeah. it's been a long time. So, yeah. you can tell us, you know, you can tell us all the, you know, the good stuff and, and, and the skinny on Chef Raider. Chef Raider is the director of the Culinary Arts Program at Indian Hills. And I think that, to me, he's the kind of guy who can really inspire in terms of the experience that he's had and his passion for for cooking. And I'm wondering how you, hey, come on, I'm putting right. you on the spot now. Uh, so um, my initial uh, take on him when I first started working there was, wow, this guy can be a total jerk sometimes. But again, I feel like that's, a facade that he puts up to make himself in charge, to make himself kind of that typical TV show chef that is in charge of everyone and running around and scoffing at things and making people constantly yearning to work harder and become greater and grow more. Um, but when you actually sit down and communicate with him, it's absolutely incredible because he's just one of the most supportive, amazing people I've ever met. and. The fact that he would answer the phone every day when I called him when I was doing an internship at Greens and talk to me about my experiences, how my day was going, how I felt about that day's cooking, what I learned, what I did, and just be that person sitting there waiting to talk to me at the end of the day. I didn't have anyone else to connect to on that level that understood besides him. And he wasn't just, he still isn't just my teacher. He's, he's a dear friend. So it's, it's, always, it's always funny going into the situation where you see him leading a class and you see him scoffing at someone or yelling or throwing something around saying, you think this is right? You think this is what it's supposed to be? No, no, work harder, do more, be better. But it's not him yelling because he's angry. It's him yelling to try to inspire people. And that's his means of, his means of doing it. And it's, he's an incredible person, so.
Astrid Griffin is our guest on KRUU's Great Taste. I'm Steve Boss, and if you're listening to the radio broadcast, you've been listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar power voice of Fairfield, Iowa, 60 minutes of delicious radio, and we hope you'll tune in again on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., that's Central Time, for the next 60 minutes of delicious radio on Crew. Now, if you're on live stream or if you're watching on FMC, you can continue to watch because... We're going to continue here, and some of you are probably wondering, when is he going to stop talking and asking her questions about her personal life? And let's talk about food, and let's see what's happening here with all these ingredients. So let's do it. Let's talk about vegan quiche, because I am intrigued. Uh, I have no idea how in the world anybody is going to make vegan quiche, but I see some very interesting ingredients here. So how did you get started when you first started thinking about doing vegan quiche? Did you do research? I'm, I'm curious as to the creative process. Um, well, it always starts with research. And one of the first things I did was I sat down with my boyfriend who owns a gluten-free vegan organic baking company. And I asked him his opinion. And we just sat down together and brainstormed every avenue that I could come from. And you can give him a plug, by the way. Oh, it's Organic Matters Kitchen. Uh, it's a really, really wonderful uh, gluten-free organic bakery. They do um, brownies. They have cookies. They have an amazing array of caramel corn, three different flavors at the moment. Hopefully more soon. Um, <laughs> but they also do a really good vegan bacon, which I use a lot in salads. I use a lot on kind of not the appropriate to use vegan bacon on eggs, but I use it on eggs all the time just because it's such a good additional flavor, salty flavor, smoky flavor. It's, oh, it's so good. It, it's my favorite product that they yeah. make. Yeah, yeah, no, it's delicious, and it's really easy to carry around. I actually ship some to my friends for their birthdays, and they just sit down and munch on it like candy. Um, but yeah, so I sat down with him, and we talked about how to go about making the crust, because I could fiddle and play around with the ingredients for the inside of it, but the base is always going to be the crust and you always want the crust to be perfect because it's what supports the rest of the ingredients and the inside may be okay but as long as the crust is amazing you always have some support that's just absolutely incredible so from there we had to kind of figure out well how do we make an amazing crust vegan and one of the things that we did was we got an organic all vegetable butter flavored shortening and so it's organic. It's a real. Is there anything? Is there anything in there, by the way? No, no, no. I because I wanted to taste the butter flavored shortening. <laughs> I want to see what does butter flavored shortening taste like. But it's all in the crust. Um, now, granted, I did ask myself the same question because I'd never had it before. This was actually experimental for me as well. Um, about a week ago, I was sitting there scratching my head, thinking, "How am I going to do a vegan quiche?" But challenge accepted. <laughs> um, so yeah, I took, a, I took a taste of it as well. It's not as salty and rich as butter is, but it's pretty darn close. And it, it worked really well for what we were doing for the crust. Um, it's not as flaky as a normal butter crust, but it, again, is, is really good, really comparable. I was going to ask you, you know, if you can get any kind of flakiness out of it. Um, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. I think it's not as flaky as, like I said, butter, but it is really good. And then instead of eggs, which my heartstrings were tugged on that, like no eggs, what? But we ended up doing a flax egg, which is, yep, two parts, uh, two and a half parts water to one part ground flax. And so we made that, we let it sit for a while. I wasn't satisfied with how it, thick it was and so we added more water to that and just kind of mashed it up and made our made our dough and who, had you ever worked with flax eggs before um once and it turned out horrible so <laughs> i'm really happy that this one was a little bit better than the last one was so okay so we've got two parts now mm -hmm. and do you have to be careful when you work with this gluten-free crust like you do with regular pie crust that you don't overwork it do you have any of those kind of issues or actually no I didn't have any issues like that um, because that's that's another thing that I kind of was mentally going over and over. How am I going to get all this incorporated into because this it doesn't the 
how am I going to say this? The shortening doesn't react the same way that butter does. Because butter, I let it warm up a little bit, and then I just squeeze it with my fingers and let it clump up, and then I just mash it all together really quick and form my dough. Whereas this one, you have to almost start with it really cold and then chunk it out with a spoon and then mash it together. So I was terrified of having this over mixing and then it was going to turn into a crusty tortilla instead of <laughs> a nice flaky pie crust. Um, and so what, what components did you use for, uh, flour components did you use? Um, just that. We used, for, for this one, I put together the organic butter flavor shortening. We did flax eggs, I had water and the flour mix. So the flour mix consists of a numerous non-gluten types of yes. flour. Um, it is going to be comprised of brown rice flour, white rice flour, arrowroot, and a little bit of xanthan gum. And then also some baking powder and baking soda, just to help it rise a little bit. So for the grains, it's strictly flour? Strictly flour. Uh-huh. I didn't do any. In the past, I've done almond, but when you add nuts or you add other things to it, you lose that flakiness. It doesn't, um, it doesn't flake as much as I'd like to. So I try to keep it just to fat and flour. Okay. So now you are going to show us actually the makings of the inside, right? You're going to teach people how to make, because this is really the hardest part, you think, of, of making a vegan quiche. The crust, if you just have the basics, you can do, mm -hmm. but the inside, making something vegan that like quiche mm -hmm. is not as easy. No, not at all. Um, about five recipes later, I, <laughs> I finally had a, the inside of the quiche that I was satisfied with and was okay with serving to everyone tonight. So um, I originally was mulling with the idea of tofu because that's kind of a generic thing. Tofu quiche, you have kind of a silken tofu that's blended together to create more of a chunky scrambled egg kind of texture and flavor. Um, but for anyone who doesn't want, <laughs> you never thought of eggs as chunky, did you? Uh, no. <laughs> um, but for those who don't want to have soy, who have allergies to soy, who just want to avoid that for one reason or another, I tried to do a different avenue, which was chickpea flour. And so basically from that, I do a chickpea roux that thickens up and then when you mix it with the vegetables it kind of as it bakes it firms up and creates almost a moist baked egg texture which okay. is which is really nice so, so do i need to move out of the way so you can get this stovetop going and yes. and, and do some stuff because this yes. is electric and that means we're going to be waiting a while so i hope you have more things that you want to say because yes. of that now while we're doing that where what happened to that magazine hold on jason i'm moving out <laughs> I thought that I would just show everybody this iPhone Life, if, if you're not familiar with that magazine. It's a great magazine if you uh, are interested in adding one more app to your phone, which seems to be a, a problem that everybody... Are you good? I have no idea how to Oh, <laughs> they can help you. Can you help her with the, with the oven? That'll be great. With the stovetop? That'd be terrific. Did you get a release from Julie, you know, for her to be on camera, Jason? <laughs> anyway, so in the current issue, which is the January, February issue, right? There's an article written by me calling, calling all culinary masters. And this is an article about chef's feed. And I think I've mentioned chef's feed before, but if I haven't, I wanted to, I want to mention it because it is the app to go to to use if you want recommendations for where to eat in large markets in the United States, Canada, and I think they have London now. Most apps that you can, and, and most things that you can find online are reviews made by consumers these days. Yelp, for example, is probably the most well known. Uh, I don't really, in general, think that consumers have any food sense for the most part. <laughs> so it's, it's, it takes me a lot of time to work through Yelp and to find somebody that I can trust uh, as to you know, where I might want to enjoy a meal. But Chef's Feed is awesome because everybody on that app is a chef. 
and they're making their own recommendations about where they like to eat and what they like to eat at a particular place. So I highly recommend that you uh, check that out. If you've got a smartphone, it's available on all platforms, not just on uh, the iPhone platform. So that's Chef's Feed, C-H-E-F-S-F-E-E-D. Great app, and it's free, which is really good. And the other thing that's fantastic is that they've been making short videos over the last few months and they really uh, I think you you find it fascinating Ostrid because they really get a lot of these chefs to open up and talk about some very personal things uh, in these short videos so they're, they're really inspirational yeah. so all right so what's happening here okay. besides the burners are starting to get hot yes well hopefully just one Good. <laughs> um, so I can put my hand here. In other yeah. words, good. Well, for now, see how we go for the rest of the show. Don't make me mad. Um. <laughs> I I couldn't possibly do that. It's really <laughs> hard to. So you're pretty in good shape. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I am starting to boil the water. I guess it's not making. Me is there an error here? It says E. Four, three. Oh, maybe it's just heating up. Maybe it's between. Maybe. It's okay. Okay. Maybe okay. <laughs> That's chickpea flour. So this is chickpea yeah. flour. And you can get it at any, you know, like natural food store, okay. that type of thing, right? I and and if you have a, if you have your own uh, mill, you can just probably mill it yourself too with chickpeas, yeah. right? Yeah, definitely. And chickpeas are amazing to have around the house just because you can do flowers with them. You can do a quick and easy hummus. Um, they're just really nice, versatile thing. You can just mix them into a salad and have like a fresh salad with cook chickpeas in them and it's it's just really nice to keep some chickpeas in your house with some fresh rosemary and tomato you can make an amazing chickpea soup yeah. with wonderful italian spices in it like herbs yeah. so with this what i am doing is i'm heating up the water and while that's heating up i am pre-mixing a cup of chickpea flour with a cup of water and then we're going to have one and a half cups of water boiling on the side Okay, and you're going to use those one and a half cups if you need to add more water to your roux? Uh, so, basically the chickpea is going to create, it's going to mix it with the water to help kind of make a paste out of it, make more of a, a soup out of that. And then you're going to add that to the hot water once it's done boiling which then will help to make it more of a roux at that point. But you want the water to be hot and then from with that, you're going to add the nutritional yeast. You're going to add a little bit of the vegetable stock. You're going to add your spices to that and basically get everything emulsified together. Okay, so everything is going to go into this roux that you're creating. And what in the world is nutritional yeast, other than the fact that it smells very strong and uh, has, I know, a very strong taste? What in the heck is it? Um, you know, actually, I scientifically don't know how it's created um i i've read about it and it's gone in one eye and out the other so <laughs> um i th haven't cooked with it very often i've always avoided it more so because it's hard to find organic nutritional yeast and so normally if i've encountered a recipe that needs nutritional yeast i find an alternate version for it but in this case the nutritional yeast was just essential in the flavor and the texture and how the how the finished product came out i tried it without i tried to use alternate versions um, and it just nothing was the same with this i ended up having to make everything else into gravy which, <laughs> which was yummy, mind you. But uh, a lot of people put it on popcorn. Yeah, no, that's when I grew up. I grew up eating it uh, fried in butter and then drizzled over popcorn, and it was it was just incredible. And then also you can use nutritional yeast as kind of a coating and then fry tofu with it. And that's also what I had a lot growing up was tofu fried in butter with nutritional yeast on it, not by my mom, but by some other family friends. That's <laughs> going. Well, no, wonder, no wonder she was like, you know, upset. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't take take the rap yeah. for that, so that's yeah. okay. That's good. All right, so you're gonna make you're gonna make a. You can see the texture that she's getting to here. She's just dissolving the garbanzo flour in the water, so that's great. And then that's gonna go directly into this water after it boils. Yep. 
And is there any salt involved here, or is, are the other ingredients have plenty of salt in them? No, uh, we're still using a salt. I'm using a black lava sea salt. Whoa, okay. And the okay. reason why I'm using this... Black lava sea salt. Uh-huh. Okay. And the reason why I'm using this as opposed to any other salt is just because of the flavor that it has. And it has a little bit more of a kind of an eggy flavor. You can smell it. It's almost more more earthy, more um, more farmy as opposed to regular regular sea salt, which it's it's very subtle. But as it cooks, it kind of gives more of a different color. It gives more of a different flavor. It just it does. Have, yeah, it absolutely has some more earthy. Yeah, yeah. It, that's exactly how I characterize it. Yeah, hmm. which is nice because when you have eggs, eggs have that earthiness to it. So, and see as we put it in there, it just the color leaches out as well, which is fun because when you put everything in there, when you start to mix everything, it kind of helps to color it a little bit so you don't just have this pasty white, basically batter that you're making for it. Um, here, I'm gonna actually pass this around to let people see. Yeah, that's a great idea. And the other thing that I, I wanna call attention to is that Astrid has all of her ingredients out. So this is something that, uh, a lot of times home cooks don't take the time to do. They're in a hurry and so they are constantly running for ingredients in different places. And really it's a much less efficient way of going about cooking. So if you take the time right up front to get all of your ingredients out and in the right spot, you'll find that your cooking process goes a lot faster for you, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and when I'm baking at home and when I'm cooking and experimenting, a lot of times I will find myself running around the kitchen like a mad woman because I realize, oh, it, it's lacking this. It needs a little bit of this. And so I'll run over and I'll grab a new spice and I'll run back and I'll pour it in. And I'm like, oh, well, it's missing a little bit of depth. I need some more acid. And so I'll run to my fridge and grab some lemon juice and come back. So definitely during the experimental process, it's a little bit more chaotic. Um, then I have it here right now <laughs> for a planned uh, for a planned event. Okay, but so so tell us a little bit about this because I'm not sure by the end of the show if this is even going to heat up. So, yeah. <laughs> so we have we have uh, the nutritional yeast is going to go in after you dissolved the chickpea flour and water into the boiling water and black salt. Yes. Uh, so I the recipe that I created for this is going to have the black salt, it's going to have nutritional yeast, it's going to have vegetable stock, and that's kind of the base of flavor. Because you don't want you don't want the batter, you don't want the quiche to come out tasting like chickpea. So you have that uh, vegetable stock to help give it more of a vegetable flavor, you have the black sea salt to give it more of a grounded earthiness. So hold on one second, I was just, so the vegetable stock you're using is actually a powdered organic vegetable yes. stock. So is that necessary because you can't use utilize more liquid you know if you made your own stock for example you wouldn't it wouldn't work because it's just more liquid that's piled in here as you need a powder um no in fact if if i were at home and i had the time and i had my stock in front of me i could and i would love to instead of using water you could just incorporate vegetable stock okay. um so instead of but it wasn't because it had to be that way yeah, to work yeah. it was because it's just a time saving convenience right. convenience so if if someone's at home and they don't have vegetable stock they don't have and if someone for some reason is not allowed to eat eggs like if i were doing this for my brother and he really wanted just some kind of meat resonance in their chicken chicken stock chicken broth um i wouldn't do beef just because it's such an overpowering and it's but chicken i mean would give it that earthiness that grounded kind of earthiness but then it wouldn't be vegan anymore but then it wouldn't be vegan but if you're if you're just trying to look for cholesterol options and kind of options and don't want an egg white quiche or want something that has still a lot of protein but i don't know if you if you're weird and you just want to make it this way so um but yeah, so you, after you get these incorporated in there, you, I also personally added the turmeric and added... Um, turmeric, all right. Yes. And smoked paprika. Smoked, smoked paprika. Sand. Yeah, smoked Spanish paprika. Okay. And then I have a black pepper. Oh, black pepper, fresh ground black pepper, mm -hmm. okay. I added cumin and mustard seeds. So 
two seeds, cumin and mustard seeds. And do you have to prepare those seeds in any way, or can you just put them right into, do you have to toast them or anything? I, I always recommend toasting, just because that breaks open the spice. It makes it more absorbable to your body. It makes it just way more flavorful in any situation. I never, unless I have to, I never like to add anything without giving it a toast first. Um, so then after all of that's added in there, the turmeric is really essential because it's the coloring. And so that's what's gonna make it look like a quiche. <laughs> Without it, the first, the first time I made this, I forgot and I used raw turmeric root. And I cut that up instead of doing a turmeric powder and it came out green. And it just- <laughs> St. Patrick's Day quiche, perfect. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> the salt, the black salt then colors it and makes it more of a green. So then the turmeric is really essential. And I, I cook with almost everything, at least has a little bit of turmeric in it just because it's a really, really good, it's a really good spice, it's a really good root to incorporate. It's a really nice anti-inflammatory for the body. It's good flavor, it's good for colors. Isn't that amazing? Oh, I love it. You wanna pass that around? That, yeah. That's great, I love, I love it too, that's why I opened it. Yeah. Uh, is it heating up? Uh, not really, no. <laughs> yeah, well, we could also just- No. No. <laughs> um, why don't we let you look at that? Okay, um, so now what else we have? We have lemon juice. What uh -huh. does that figure into? That is for the greens that we're going to be wilting in at the very end. Mm. Oh, what, did you say I had accidentally Somebody turned it off? I, I was going to say, you know, I, pointing your finger right at me. Somebody else. Some, someone did. Okay, okay. Well, there weren't too many people up here, so obviously it was one of us. Oh, I was over here. Uh, it was, oh, it was well, completely. Obviously it was me. Okay. <laughs> So after, well, we'll wait for that to get up. Um, trying to decide whether I should talk about the greens or if I should keep going with this. Let's I think let's, let's finish yeah. going with this, yeah. but we may have to talk about the greens because yeah. we have about 10 minutes left, a little bit less than 10 minutes. So. so what I'm doing right now is I'm adding the nutritional yeast. Is that true? We only have, I mean, can we do whatever we want or do we need to be out of here? <laughs> I don't even know the rules, so you don't know the rules either, so I'll tell you what, we'll just continue, and then you can, you know, do whatever you want in your magic editing room, all right? I think it's a pretty safe bet to say we have food, we can stay. Oh, I like that. <laughs> okay. Matter of fact, I can tell you that we have lots of food, so mm -hmm. we don't have to be concerned about that, but I think that needs to probably go up a little bit, don't you think? Yeah. Um, well, it's been in there for a little while. At, it was originally at 150, now it's at 100. I just don't want it to dry out too much. So when it gets closer to turning it up would be really good, which it is 10 minutes to, so. <laughs> <laughs> don't say I'm not concerned. <laughs> <laughs> and also I notice over here, there are a couple of other things. There's some, some balsamic vinegar and there's some extra virgin olive oil. So is that all part of the wilting of the vegetables? Yeah. Okay, so we, we'll get there. Uh, I'm, I'm rushing you here. For myself, I am a complete butter fiend. I love butter. I want to have my own cows, make my own butter. I would safely say that at least a butter, a stick of butter is consumed on a daily basis in my household. Um, so it was really hard for me trying to prepare everything and not making it with butter. Um, that being said, I also love olive oil and coconut oil when I'm cooking. So with the greens, instead of doing a stick of butter and some lemon juice for it, I'm going to do olive oil, lemon juice, and balsamic vinegar. So. Okay, that sounds great for that. And, and what are those going to, how are they going to find their way into the quiche? Are they going to actually be in the filling? Or are they going to be baked in, in other words? Um, on top of the quiche. On top. Because when you, when you bake, this is also a mistake I made a couple times. Baking greens into a quiche kind of helps, it, it retains the water. And so then instead of having like a nice moist but dry quiche, it almost acts like the quiche hasn't fully baked when it's completely cooked. Um, and I encountered that a couple times when I was making quiche because I just got super excited about adding greens to it, adding spinach, adding red chard, adding like that green to my quiche itself. and it just every time backfires on me and my quiche is always a little bit more moist than I would hope for. So at the end, what I thought I would do was I would just do a really quick cook and wilt down of the kale um, with the balsamic vinegar. And I want it to be a very kind of acidic, vinegary 
greens, which are very lightly spiced with just a little bit of black pepper, and that's it. And then that's going to go on top of each of the pieces of quiche. Nice. Yeah. Very, very nice. And we want to thank once again our sponsor, Everybody's, who provides all the wonderful organic ingredients that go into this quiche, and of course, Green Building Supply for being the host of the show, and Fairfield Media Center for recording everything, and Jason Strong, who's here. And Astrid, I am totally fat i just can't wait to try yeah. this this quiche and i'm wondering i don't want to put you on the spot but i will do you mind would you mind sharing this recipe with everybody not at all not at all so um do you want me to share it now or do you want me to give yes i think it'd be great <laughs> both both later and also now because because again you know we're gonna those greens are not going to be wilted by the time we're off the air so <laughs> yeah yeah definitely um so the crust is um, a gluten-free flour mix, and you can basically use any kind of crust that you want, any flour mix that you want for that. I made my own. I made it with my boyfriend, like I said. Um, but you can find gluten-free flour mix on the store shelves. You can find recipes yeah. all over the internet. So however you want to do it, it's a gluten-free flour mix. Well, and they might even have some. I know there's a couple of stores that I've gone to, health food stores that have the bulk section, and they'll have like a bulk flour, gluten-free flour mix too, which is always a nice option for people who want to buy in bulk whenever they can. Um, so for that, I did the the organic shortening, the vegan shortening, and then I did the flour mix and then flax eggs. And then after I had that, I put it in the fridge for a while, let it cool down, brought it back out, rolled it out, made my pie crust, and pre-baked it. Then for the actual vegan... There's, there's probably even recipes online, I'm sure, for mm -hmm. vegan pie crust that would use exactly those ingredients, flax eggs, yeah. and the gluten-free mix, and... Mm -hmm. Um, the butter flavor shortening. <laughs> yep. I'm kind of curious as to, I didn't do much research into this because I knew that this is the shortening that I wanted to use, but I am curious as to whether people have other options or other ideas as to what fat to incorporate to give it that buttery flakiness. Coconut oil? Coconut oil definitely could be. Um, Too coconutty tasting, probably. It, yeah, exactly. It would have that coconut taste, and I know a lot of people have that aversion to it in it. It definitely wouldn't have the same um, emotional resonance as something that would be more mild in flavor would kind of create when eating a quiche. But um, so for the vegan quiche, the actual mixture itself, I have it all written out here just in case you ask me that question. One cup chickpea flour to two and a half cups water. And like I said, you're going to mix that one cup of chickpea flour with one cup of water and then put the extra cup and a half on the side to heat up. So let that then immerse all the other ingredients together. It's, it's, barely it's like barely there. It's, it's, luckily, she's made quiche and we can yeah. eat it. <laughs> it was just a demo. Um, but then you have... Uh, the recipe itself called for a vegetable stock cube. And now, like I said, if you have your own vegetable stock, if you have your own, um, you could even buy like a pre-boxed stock if you wanted to. Um, but the vegetable cube, vegetable powder, that all works just fine. Um, it just has a little slightly different of a taste. And you can also, if you buy a pre-mixed but you want the flavor to be a little bit stronger, you can also incorporate um, some of the powder to it as well. If you, that tickles your fancy. Um, then there's also this recipe called for a half a teaspoon of sage. I have not cooked very much with sage. I, I've used it in other recipes, but it's not one of my go-to spices. So it was a little bit interesting cooking with the sage. Just were you using fresh or dried? Dried. I tried to get fresh, but um, the store was out of the fresh. So we're going with dried this time. Um, and then there's the half teaspoon of turmeric. A lot of times when I'm cooking, I don't measure. I, I measure with my nose, I measure with my eyes, I measure with how it looks and how it tastes as opposed to actually going by a recipe. And for me, I just poured it in until when I stirred it, I saw that it had the color of the turmeric in there. So it had that nice kind of egg yellow look to it. I don't think we can, I don't think we can see that, but we might be able to see it a little bit. No? Okay, that's all right. <laughs> Well, it's beautiful, just to let you know. Uh, and then there's the um, three tablespoons of nutritional yeast, which is quite a bit, but it really, really needs that to help solidify it and give it that flavor, that eggy flavor to it. And then there's the half teaspoon of black salt. And like I said, I tried it using other versions of the salt, and it just wasn't the same. So the black salt is definitely 
key to having that earthy grounded flavor. Um, and so after you have all of the ingredients, make your one side mix of chickpea flour and water, put everything else into the pan and let it start cooking, boiling. Once it comes to a boil, slowly whisk in the chickpea flour mix. And you're gonna wanna really slowly and make sure you keep whisking it so it doesn't burn to the bottom of the pan. Turn down the heat, let it cook for about two to three minutes. I, I cooked mine actually for about three and a half minutes just because it wasn't thickening the way I wanted it to until it gets thick and glossy and you want it to be thick. I made the mistake of taking it off the burner before it was thick enough and my quiche came out more like gravy. So you want it to have that thickness to it so it kind of stays together and holds it more like it would if it were actual eggs. And then um, once that is thick, you incorporate in all the veggies that you've pre-made, mix it together and then put it into the pie pan and just immediately throw it in the oven. Um, for mine, I used sliced tomatoes over the top of it because after making a couple of them, I realized that they weren't the most attractive quiche I've ever made. So I did the tomatoes on the top just to give the color and texture variants to distract kind of from, um, distract from just kind of the, the color of the egg quiche itself because it's, it's not, it doesn't flake up and become crispy and brown like a normal quiche would. So that tomato gives it a little bit more of a visual okay. appeal let's let's show everybody yeah. before we before we end the show let's let's take a look here okay. at the difference between the vegan quiche <laughs> and the regular quiche <laughs> Ooh, that's so pretty and they're both mm. absolutely amazing so don't be prejudiced really against pretty. one or the other really but so there's that and that quiche is made with just normal ingredients I would normally use. Eggs and butter in the crust, eggs in the quiche. Slice me up a big one on that Yeah. <laughs> so there's that right there. Um, actually, yeah, let me leave that out. And then here is the gluten-free. It looks lovely, quiche. actually. And, yeah. and now what you're going to do is you're going to put the kale on top of that, the wilted I'll kale on top. The wilted kale. That'll look beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yep, especially with the balsamic vinegar and it'll kind of re-moisten the top of it. It'll add a lot more taste difference it'll be chewy it'll be yeah it's just it's gonna be really good awesome. so do you want to smell oh really nice yeah, yeah that's really yeah. nice yep it, and all the um the bite i'll say of the nutritional yeast is gone from that smell uh -huh. i mean it's much m more muted yeah yeah and that's that's what uh, the boiling process is for it definitely takes out the <laughs> yeah, we've got it going now yeah, yeah I uh, turned it way up <laughs> <laughs> that's um it cooks out the flour taste it cooks out the nutritional yeast it kind of like levels everything and nice. yeah it makes it all smooth and work together so. terrific Astrid Griffin's been our guest on great taste this is 60 minutes of delicious radio or TV, whatever you have, you know, whatever your preference is, media-wise. I'm Steve Boss, and I want to thank you very much for being here, and I can't wait to eat both of these. Oh, wait, but, actually, oh. you know what? So, I forgot, just for presentation's sake, I made some really adorable little mini those quiche, are, too. Those are so adorable. If you're hosting people, if you have people coming over, and there are people with different dietary requirements, but they all have the same base that they want for it, you can customize each of your little quiche. I made some for Christmas, and I made my mom's without, uh, without onions and garlic, just so she would be able to have hers, and my sister's without cream cheese in it so she could have hers which is just really nice and it looks adorable on a plate when you open your <laughs> restaurant you're gonna be one busy girl because I'll tell you what anybody who's got their own little food foibles is gonna come to you and say hey can you make this with you know exactly the way I want it I all right <laughs> so join us again <laughs> when we when we're back at Green Billing Supply one month because we're here the first Tuesday of every month doing Great Taste Live. And please listen to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar power voice of Fairfield, Iowa, 7 p.m. on Wednesdays, Central Time, and again on Friday, 7 a.m. on Fridays. I'm Steve Boss, and thank you one more time to Green Building Supply, everybody's, and Fairfield Media Center. Great Taste. Sweet. So good to taste.